So the first one says, uh, if a cat is suspected of amyloid amyloidosis, is a full uh, post-mortem uh, necessary or can a partial one, which I don't quite know what that means, but probably you do, can a partial one be carried out by any vet? It is a very good question. And I can understand that there are many people out there, particularly if they've had to recently say goodbye to a cat that they have grown up with, that they've watched be born, be brought up and then had in your household. It's very difficult after they pass away to be able to make that decision for samples to be collected. They don't need to have a full <laughs> post-mortem examination. All we need to get a diagnosis is a piece of the tissue that is affected. That means that we need a small piece, usually about the size of a sugar cube, of the liver or of the kidneys if those are the organs that are affected. That tissue can be collected from a small incision into the abdomen. Most vets can do that because it's the type of incision that we would make if we were um, kind of neutering or doing a cesarean section in a, in, a, in a queen. So it is something that the vets can do. Um, afterwards, we can then stitch the abdomen shut. So for people that want to take their cats home to bury them at home, that is definitely an option as well. Um, again, I have done partial post-mortems on, on cats and on dogs to try and find out what's going on there. And it is definitely possible to do. Uh, the next one that comes from a um, veterinary practice says, what is the best way to diagnose with certainty as kidney biopsies can be traumatic? Kidney biopsies are always traumatic. Okay, so by taking a kidney biopsy, you are effectively taking a small piece of kidney. Like anything that we do is traumatic to a certain extent. We know that when we do do kidney biopsies or even just a kidney aspirate, there is a risk of about 10 to 20% that we can have bleeding as a result of that. Okay, that means that in most of the cats that we get biopsies from, the risk of bleeding is, 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 is kind of, well, it's there at the 10 to 20%. So most of the cases, you know, we'll get away with it. But there will be a significant proportion of cats that will have a significant bleed after doing that biopsy. We know that in our amyloidosis cats, if we do that biopsy, the risk of them bleeding is greater. Now, the needle biopsies, it's less invasive. Um, we can get tissues from outside the body, often using a very small needle to be able, well, a small incision to be able to do that. The difficulty is, is that when we do the biopsy, we're not actually able to watch the kidney itself and to make sure it stops bleeding. Whereas if we were to do a surgical biopsy, we can actually watch it and stop it from bleeding. Now, in the situation where we think it could be liver and kidney, then, kid then the liver actually is an easier place for us to biopsy. I think the risk would be a bit lower in those cases. And certainly it's a lot easier to stop the bleeding from the liver itself. But the difficulty that we have is that whilst biopsy can give us an answer, what it's doing is it's giving us an answer of a disease that will ultimately reduce the life of our cats that we cannot do anything about. And this is something that I come across quite a lot when I do research into FIP. When we're taking biopsies to try and confirm FIP, we're ultimately doing biopsies to confirm that there's a disease there that we cannot treat, that we cannot do anything about, that will make the life of our cats shorter. So whilst doing biopsies is often very good because it can then tell us to stop looking for other things, we have to think very carefully about what other possibilities there may be because it might not change how we treat them. There's always going to be a risk when we biopsy these cats, unfortunately. And there's no way, even if we do the best standard that we can do, even if you were to have biopsies taken by a specialist, that risk would still be there. So one question is whether or not, you know, is how to get hold of samples, whether or not you get samples from the brain, for example, if there was a problem, say, dementia. So again, it comes, it's really, really difficult to, to be able to, um, to say which samples are going to be best. I think ultimately it comes down to the risks associated with collecting the samples versus the benefit of being able to, um, um, of being able to diagnose a particular disease. Um, certainly, 
we do do craniotomies um, on our, some of our feline patients. We do it in feline patients that have brain tumours, for example. So we, we not so commonly, if there's a, what we call a meningioma, so a tumour on the surface of the brain, we can sometimes remove those to get samples. That's diseases that we can potentially treat. When it comes down to amyloidosis that's affecting the brain, for example, the risks of actually getting those samples, of doing that biopsy, currently outweigh the benefits of being able to get those samples. There are cats um, where, because of where their disease is, after they've passed away, when we want to try and find out or confirm where it is, we have collected samples of tissue from the brain. It's not something that is attempted by GP vets, to be honest. Um, to be honest, it's not something that's attempted by me. I, I get my neurology colleagues to help me with that. Is there any early testing we can do, such as regular bloods? If so, how often should we do this, particularly if breeding from cats where we believe that, it, that there is illness in the line? Sadly, there, there isn't any way of doing it. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult. Um, now, I don't think anybody has looked to see whether or not serially biopsying the livers of cats is able to identify the disease early. It's not that I'm advocating serially biopsying the liver of cats, okay, um, but I don't even know whether that is potentially an option. We know that in some of these cats, it takes a long time for it to develop. It's not necessarily that it'll develop kind of um, uniformly all over the place. Sometimes it can affect one organ more than another. Sometimes it can affect one area of an organ more than another. So that's, again, why it's so difficult to diagnose. And that's one of the reasons why, if we are able to get a genetic test out there, that it's so important. Because then we can identify those cats that are going to be likely to get the disease. We'll be able to identify those cats that are potentially carrying the disease when they are young cats, prior to breeding. That's, that's the reason why we're trying to do that. Does the diagnosis of the um, affected um, gene or genes, do they need to be carried out on both parents? I mean, in terms of the mouse swabs for the study? Yes. It doesn't need to. So what we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying to get swabs from a group of cats that we can categorise. We want to be able to, um, if I can go back a couple of things onto here, okay. This is actually something called a, what we call a Manhattan plot. And what it does is that they've taken two groups of cats, for example, one group of cat that's affected and one group of cats that's not affected. And what they've done is they've looked through the entire genome of both of those sets of cats and then compared the differences. Because they know that if you go from one individual to the next individual, there may be some cats in one group that are red, some cats in another group that are going to be black, some are going to be blue, some are going to be lilac, um, some are going to be our, um, our pointed cats, some are going to be our um, kind of orientals. And we know that those are going to be existent in both pathways. So you're going to get some genes and variations at kind of every level. But when we compare the affected to the non-affected, what we're hoping to find is that there will be one position on the genome or a couple of positions on that genome where all of the cats that are affected have a particular mutation and very few of the cats that are not affected. Because that will tell us where the problem is. And this is what happened in this situation here. This is a different, different mutation. The thing is, is that to be able to make that comparison, to get rid of the noise, to be able to get that very strong signal to where to look, we have to be able to really say that this is a group that's affected and this is a group that is not affected. There are always going to be the in-betweens and those in-betweens are going to be useful to us as well when we start looking at the population in general. So as many samples as we can get is going to be better. And we can do a rough prediction if we, if we ultimately, at the end of the day, if we do find out what the mutation is, if we knew from one parent, we can have a prediction as to how it's going to be passed on to their offspring. We don't, yeah. If we have an affected kind of offspring, it is always going to be useful to have one of the parents to try and look to see what's happening there as well.
In terms of who's getting the data, who's processing it and going forward, so within the UK, it's actually been coordinated by my colleague Chris Helps. He's the head of the Molecular Diagnostics Unit at University of Bristol. He, for years, has worked with um, a, an amazing cat geneticist called Leslie Lyons in the States. So his role is actually just to receive the samples. Then they're going to be stored in a freezer so that we can preserve them. And then they're going to be batch, either prepped or sent as swabs out to a lady called Maria, who is another vet geneticist who's working with Leslie Lyons in Italy. So she's kind of coordinating it from a European point of view. We are very used to handling the data. We're very used to handling genetics. We know that when people partake in these studies, that they do it anonymously. We know that there is you know, no way that if we were to kind of put the names of the animals that we know to be affected out there, that we would ever get anybody submitting a sample to us again. Um, we have to be extremely careful when it comes down to data protection with regards to that. And prior to us doing any studies with any of the cases that we do, we actually have to go through rigorous ethics testing um, and to be able to communicate um, where the data is going to be kept, how it is going to be communicated, who gets access to that data. Um, so, and that's one of the things is that I know that there are going to be some, you know, some people out there that you think you might have amyloidosis out there, that you think you might know of a cat in your line that could have had that disease, but you don't want to talk about it to other people, okay? And that is fine. If that's what you want at the moment, that is completely fine. But what we'd ask is that samples are submitted because the, the, you know, whether or not your neighbor has submitted a sample, you're, they're not gonna know, you know from, from one person to the next. But the more samples that we get, the more we can put it together. Now, what that does mean is that if we do identify a genetic mutation, we're not going to be able to let the people of those affected cats necessarily know that that's the situation. Okay. What we would be able to say is that there is a problem out there and that we found it, but then unmasking it and letting people know might not be possible. Um, so that's one. And, and the other thing is, is that whilst people do submit swabs, if they don't necessarily fit into our categories, they may not be part of a particular batch that is run. So one of the things about submitting them anonymously is that they are then typically processed anonymously such that it's not possible to reflect back to the original person. Do the swabs have space to include as to why they are being swabbed, i.e. a full brother to a deceased cat which was post-mortem to amyloidosis. What we really need is just contact details. And what I can do um, is that if, you're, if the website doesn't come up, I can almost always get the forms posted out to you to be sent back to us. Um, so that's certainly something that we can do. So, that's, so rather than writing everything on a tube, which I appreciate is not easy, to be honest, we're usually happy just to have the cat's name on it. Um, and on a piece of paper, you can always write the reasons why. Um, but as I said, I had really hoped to be able to give you some submission forms today, but that sadly was not the case. Um, if you do use the submission for the, the lab packs that I've got down there, please write on them if you're wanting to send them in for the amyloidosis study for the attention of either myself or Chris Helps so that they are diverted away from our reception that normally takes the swabs for things like HCM screening, the coat colour testing. Um, otherwise, we're going to have a whole confused group of my reception staff as we get a whole, lo whole load of swabs arrive. Does one kitten um, from a litter that goes on to have symptoms diagnosed as am amyloidosis mean that others from the same mating will be from the same carriers? No, so I think this is what it comes back to when I was talking about, you know, whilst if we do identify the genetic defect that's resulting in this disease, you know, whilst we would almost certainly, if we look back through the history, be able to identify, you know, track it back to which lines are affected, but why it is not helpful in that kind of situation. So it ultimately comes down to how this gene causes a problem. So, for example, if it is a recessive mutation in an individual, so that individual has managed to get two defective forms of the allele, it would have had a defective form 
from the queen and a defective for, from, from the tom. Now, if the queen and the tom were just carriers of that defect, then if we look at their offspring, there's a 25% chance that they would have been carrying both defective ones and ending up with disease. There's two 25% chances, so 50% chance that they will have just inherited one defect, either from the mother or from the father. And there's a 25% chance that they won't be a carrier at all. Um, and that's where it's really important that we don't write off particular lines. Now, the other problem is, is that if you have a, kit, uh, a litter of four kittens and one is affected, it doesn't mean that you're going to have two other carriers and one that's clear of the disease. Unfortunately, for each individual kitten, they carry that 25% chance of being affected, uh, sorry, 25% chance of yeah, being affected, 50% chance of being a carrier, and 25% chance of being clear of it. Okay. And that's if it's a recessive gene. Until we know which cats are affected, it's going to be impossible to be able to predict what treatments we have options out there. And again, usually by the time we know that they're affected, they're often very severely affected. So trying to reverse it is not something we can do at the moment. If we can't treat the disease itself, can we address the symptoms? Yes, it is possible to address some of the symptoms that we have. The difficulty is, is that a lot of those, the clinical signs and symptoms that we get are going to be related to organ damage um, and kind of organ failure. So for example, if we've got disease that's related to the kidneys and the kidneys are functioning at a lower capacity, we can treat those as we would say a cat with chronic kidney disease. We can put them on a diet that's lower in protein, lower in phosphate, to put a, less, a lower challenge on the kidneys that are not functioning normally. We know that cats that have kidneys that aren't functioning can get high blood pressure if they're not functioning normally, so we can give them medication to help with that. But what it doesn't ultimately do is slow it down. In some cases as well with, with the systemic amyloidosis, because we feel that it's associated in part with an inflammatory response, some people have given those patients steroids to try and reduce that inflammatory response. And some cats appear to benefit from that. The difficulty is, is that a lot of cats seem to benefit from having a dose of steroids every now and again. Whether or not that's helpful in their disease is a different matter, but it can sometimes make them feel a bit better. The other thing that we'll sometimes do is that if a patient has damage or rupture to an organ, we might give them things like blood transfusions to get them over that initial bleeding process. And then their liver or their kidneys will heal, but they will still be at risk of having problems of bleeding afterwards. Is there a significance between hormonal and diet change? I don't think we know enough about it to be able to say that there is. I think the difficulty that we have at the moment is actually being able to identify those cats that have amyloidosis. So the only way that we can actually work out what influence things like recent stress, the change in diet, and so on and so forth has on the progression of the disease and the development of the disease is actually being able to diagnose the disease properly before they start to be affected. And unfortunately, the reality is, is that means we're going to be able to need to find a genetic way of doing it just to start off with. Um, then we can kind of track back and work out what we can do in our affected cats to reduce the likelihood of them developing the disease. Um, um, you know, and again, hopefully not breed from those ones. In terms of unfolding the gene, um, we would love for it to be like that. The difficulty is, is as much as they say that the whole cat genome has been sequenced, um, it has for one cat, an Abyssinian. Um, it hasn't been fully looked at though. Um, it is millions and millions of, of, of base pairs long and it's full of junk um, or DNA that we're not too sure what it encodes. The other difficulty that we have with the serum amyloid A protein and the gene that encodes it is that there's more than one version. There are a number of versions, I think there's about four in humans and they're scattered across the genome itself. 
Um, so even if we were able to work out which one it was, again, it starts becoming much more difficult to determine it. And the reason why I had a Sonic the Hedgehog on here, it wasn't that my son's old enough for Sonic the Hedgehog yet. It's because polydactyly in cats that we see. Um, I know we don't see it in our, at least we shouldn't see it in our Siamese and Orient Orientals, but when we do get polydactyly amongst our domestic short hairs, domestic long hairs, it's because there's a defect in the promoter region of a gene called Sonic the Hedgehog um, that increases the amount of a particular protein that makes an extra bud on the end of the paw. So it's completely out, far out from where we would expect, to, expect it to be. That's why when they found this gene, they called it Sonic Hedgehog, because at the time they didn't realize how significant it was. Because the, the, the guy that found it is now really embarrassed that he named it Sonic Hedgehog. Um, so that's where it comes down to being really difficult. Because it might be really easy, it may be on the gene that encodes that particular kind of protein, but potentially it's going to be on a different area of the genome, maybe in the junk DNA bit that affects the production level of this particular protein. That's where it ends up being really, really difficult. I think they have looked at the, the amyloid in the cats that are affected and in normal Siamese, and it looks like the same protein. So whether or not something goes wrong in our patients that have amyloidosis, if maybe they're producing too much of it or in excess, something is, is definitely not right in that, but it is not as simple as we would like it to be, unfortunately. That's why we end up having to literally throw loads of samples at the machine and then get a computer to do the very careful working out of it. Um, the, in terms of differentiating, I think it's motor neuron disease um, and this one, again, the difficulty about differentiating it is that what we're probably going to need to do is we're assuming because of it's a, in a particular breed and um, in terms of being in the Siamese and in the Orientals, that it is a one single problem. That's why we're not looking at the Abyssinians and the Siamese together. We don't think it's the same thing. Um, that's where we're starting off at the moment. Um, it may be further down the line. We identify actually it's two groups, but the likelihood is it's just one particular problem. With a number of the cases that are presented with amyloidosis, the signs aren't that clear. They're, they are signs that are consistent with a cat that has a disease, that is inappetent, that when they become inappetent and they're lethargic and they don't want to move, cats, unfortunately, they'd like to curl themselves up in a ball and look very miserable. And we can sometimes support them through that. We can give them fluids, we can give them medication to stimulate their appetite. And some of those cats will turn the corner. We know that for a lot of the other forms of systemic amyloidosis, there is a relationship to inflammation that's happening in the body. The more inflammation that happens, the more of this serum amyloid is produced, the more the problem is. But that will wax and wane. We also know that for some of our patients with the amyloidosis, particularly as their organs start to become more significantly affected, they do have bleeding. They have bleeding typically into their abdomen as their liver kind of splits and has problems. And if you do have an episode of bleeding, I don't know whether it's much less extreme, but if you've ever gone and given blood, I used to give blood before I had my little one and then lost two and a half litres. Um, but if you lose a pint of blood, you often feel tired and a bit run down. And you'd often drink a bit more and just don't feel quite right. And a few days later, you feel fine again, not a problem at all. Um, and the same thing that can happen, but in a much more extreme way. Now, we don't see these cats are, are, are losing blood, even though they're probably losing the equivalent of a couple of pints into their abdomen. And that's the reason why we don't see it. They may look a bit bloated for a day. They may look a bit not quite right. When we look at their gums, they may just look a little bit pale. But cats, again, they can look pale when they're unwell anyway. And within a few days later, they may start be looking pink again because we know that if we do bleed into our abdomen, then we can actually reabsorb quite a bit of that blood. And that's one of the reasons why we can have a waxing and waning clinical signs. We know that some of our cats, if we manage to support them through their disease, they can go on for a number of months, sometimes even a bit longer with it as well. Sometimes they're affected more than others. <coughs> 
and this can make it very difficult to diagnose. Particularly <coughs> when, it looks, when we look at the blood work, the findings are going to be very, very nonspecific. When we do the imaging of the abdomen, we might see changes that the livers may be a bit bigger than normal, maybe that the kidneys are a bit bigger than normal. But there are also a number of other diseases like lymphoma, like inflammation of the liver, like hepatitis and like cholangitis, um, that can also result in the same things. So that's where it can be really difficult in terms of trying to, trying to get a diagnosis. That's where one of the important things that we do have is that if you do have a cat that is affected, or if you know that of the other cats that are affected, is that if they are unwell for whatever reason, is that you flag it to their vet, your, their vet, that systemic amyloidosis is on the differential list for this breed. Um, and it, that is one of the reasons why we want to make, particularly um, breeders and owners of the Siamese and the Orientals, a bit more aware about this as a disease. Um, we really, really hope that your cats aren't affected by it because it's horrid. But if you think your cat could be affected by it, Unfortunately, it's going to be having to, you know, you know, admit to your vet, if not your friends, that that is a potential problem. <laughs>